All right, grace and peace, everybody. It is so real here with another video. Um, and today we're really going to be getting into a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's basically one that's been on my heart for some time now about an amazing analogy that really breaks down salvation and what it's really about um, in terms of that. And it is really about the life cycle of fruit. Now, I know salvation gets talked about in a bunch of poetic ways, but, you know, I personally think they're relating to it, to the growth of fruit kind of hits a nail on the head better than any other metaphor. And also this analogy is something that I think it's just it's not something that I came up with. It's actually used all throughout the Bible, of course, from Genesis to Revelation. But when you take a closer look at the life cycle of fruit, you start to see why God and the biblical authors use it to describe people's spiritual lives. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and kind of get into this topic here. Um, this is something that if I want you guys to kind of share, share the link, like and subscribe. Um, but just looking at a fruit knowing that where it came from knowing everything that goes into it knowing what is expected to come out of it you start to see why god and the biblical offers used it to describe people's spiritual lives so just like fruit goes through distinct phases from flowering to ripening or even to rotting our lives also go through this process as well you know be it for good or evil and so it really determines you know whether we ultimately bear good fruit bad fruit or no fruit at all until our last breath so the quality of the fruit usually reflects the condition of the tree or the vine that it grows from as well in in a lot of cases and of course not in all cases because we can see that, you know, if Christ is the incorruptible and yet we're supposed to bear fruit in him, well, that leads us to John 15 if we don't. If you don't know what's in John 15, don't worry, we'll get there. I'm just trying to pretty much set everything up so we can be on the same page. Now, in other words, you can look and you can see in the same way that fruit grows in our lives. And that can be from our words or deed or character. And it pretty much kind of reflects the health of our soul. So I want to get into the nitty gritty of how this all works. Because understanding the connection between fruit and our salvation walk will pretty much change how you see, you know, maybe even your, your, your path and purpose in life. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right in. And, you know, hey, if this resonates with you guys so far... Um, please definitely uh, hit the like button. The Edenic Language of God. This is the first place that I really want to start with. Because one thing that I've noticed when I continue to just read the word, and especially when I ran into a book, I believe it's called the uh, Book of Biblical Imagery, it showed how much God uses fruit in the way that he talks of course not just about fruit itself but specifically about people and whole nations one thing i notice is that when it comes to eden paradise and persia these three places pretty much have a a very interesting historical link so if i want to go ahead and start about fruit the first place we're going to start with is i believe the the most precious area of where God wanted fruit to begin. If you look in Genesis 2 8, you'll see the usual passage where it says, And God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And we pretty much kind of know about that. When we think of the Garden of Eden, we automatically go to Genesis 2. However, if you look in other translations, you'll start to notice something pretty interesting. So with the contemporary version, the CPDV, it says, Now the Lord had planted a paradise of enjoyment from the beginning, and he placed a man whom he had formed. 
paradise. Now, you look and you'll notice that especially in the Septuagint, which was written in 250 BC, it was the KJV of Christ and the Disciples Day, they would have read this very word here in the Greek Septuagint Old Testament. It is paradisia or paradisos. It's paradise. So Eden is actually paradise. It says from the Sanskrit, paradisa, a foreign or ornamental garden attached to a mansion. Now, if you pretty much kind of know where I'm going with this, you would know that there's one person in particular that uses these two words, mansion and paradise, in the New Testament. And I think you all know who that is. That is Jesus. We all know the two areas where, one, he spoke to the disciples, and two, he spoke to the two thieves, or at least a thief on the cross. He said to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is Eden. And of course, the disciples, we all know, what did he say? He said, I go away to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you this. So it seems that when Jesus is talking about when people are going to be with him, he's constantly talking about Eden and also things that are in Eden. And I know we get excited about going to heaven, but something tells me that whatever heaven is, Eden has to be there. So, also, it's a loan word. Yes, this word pedidizos here is a loan word. What is a loan word? A loan word is a word that's adopted into another language. In other words, the people who made up their language did not make up this word. Perhaps they got around, they looked at other languages, other peoples, got in contact with other cultures, started hearing them use this certain word that describes something similar to what they have, and they simply adopted it. Like for example, the word kamikaze, or the word, goodness, karaoke. Karaoke obviously is a Japanese word, it is not an American word, but hey, when we use it over here, we all know what we're talking about. So we adopted a word, you know, that pretty much matched um, something that we all do, that we didn't derive from our own language. So. That's a little something on paradise, but what does this have to do with bearing fruit? Now you notice, again, I already went to Luke 23, 43, where Jesus said, truly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. And I spoke about how this word paradise is not just in the Greek Septuagint, but it's also in the douay Rheims Bible. And the douay Rheims Bible is basically based off of the Latin Vulgate. So the Latin Vulgate that was written in the 400s AD um, by Jerome, he used it as well. The Peshitta for the, um, the Assyrians, well, they use it as well. The Polyglot, which basically reflects the Septuagint, you see it there as well. And of course, again, it is a loan word. But again, if a mansion is something that has a garden attached to it, and paradise is that garden, then the question is, where will we be when we take our last breath? And will there be fruit? Yes. Palace Garden of Persia. So if we really want to know where the concept of Eden came from, a paradise actually came from, the Hebrews who wrote the Old Testament, they didn't just draw this out of the sky or anything like that. No, it came from a very real concept that was around them. And they pretty much put it in their book in Genesis where God was expressing about his paradise. So in Persia, you kind of notice the Persian kings had a great love of gardens, and they built many beautiful parks and gardens throughout their empire. The royal gardens were said to be modeled after the Garden of Eden with their lush vegetation and flowers and trees. The kings believed that these gardens were a symbol of their divine right to rule, and they spent much time and money in their keep-up or their upkeep. 
And so, you know, that's a book on the Persian Empire by Emily Kurt. And so you can see that if you had a garden back then, a huge farm area with lush vegetation and things are just growing seemingly out of nowhere yes you do have people to till the ground it pretty much shows your prowess and your provider potential as a king as a great ruler you're able to be plentiful the more plentiful you're able to be the more you're able to go ahead and provide for those who are around you and the more and longer that they stay alive is a reflection of the life that you give as a king and your divine right to rule. Like the gods must really be with you. So that's the reason why gardens were so politically important. Now, there was a guy named Herodotus who was, you know, a Greek father of history. And he spent a lot of time in these places, supposedly. And he writes about them. He says, quote, the garden is square, and each side of its four plethora long. It is oriented toward the south wind, and blows most frequently in Babylon. And the walls surrounding the garden are made of baked brick. These base, yeah, the base of the terrace which supports the garden is about 50 meters high, and the highest terrace itself, crowned by a palace, is close to 100 meters high. The ascent to the utmost terrace is made by a stairway. Now, when we talk about stairways, you know, that's kind of getting into to something else. It has a lot to do with Genesis 11, uh, but we're not going to go in and get into those type of towers. But anyway, you could see that whatever a garden was, it just wasn't something that Persia did, but it was also something that Babylon did as well. But for the ancient Near East, it was a king's royalty that was a sign of his divine rule and prosperity is the reason why he had these gardens. But when it came to God, it was a whole different thing. It was a meaning of his creation, the crown of everything that he made. And also it was to go ahead and foster his divine presence. That was the reason why God made Eden. So you can pretty much see a difference in, in the two there. Which tells a lot about God when he gave Eden to us. Now these are some nerd notes. You can take a snapshot of this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip all this. You know, I just like to go ahead and give you guys some extra things. Just in case you might want to get lost in some wonderful rabbit holes. Which I definitely encourage you guys to do. Palace Garden of Babylon. As I had said... You had already saw how Herodotus was describing, you know, very similar gardens that were seen in Persia. But, you know, Babylon was basically the people who kind of started it off. They went a little earlier than the Persians because they ruled before the Persians. So if you really want to know where this idea really came from, I likely would go ahead and contribute it to the Babylonian gardens in Persia. In his palace, he erected very high walks, supported by stone pillars, and by planting what is called a pensile paradise, and replenishing it with all sorts of trees, he rendered the prospect an exact rem resemblance of a mountainous country. This he did to gratify his queen, because she had been brought up in Medea, and was fond of, mountainous, of a mountainous situation. Now, that was written by Barossus. He was a Babylonian priest of Marduk. Of course, Marduk was a minor god, but throughout time, he eventually became the major god of Babylonian uh, religion. Um, and that's because he had de defeated his great-great-grandmother, Tiamat. <laughs> uh, don't want to get into that. But anyway, Josephus, he was a Greek or you know Jewish historian. He lived in the first century, during the time of Jesus. And uh, he basically is quoting this guy. And this is from 280 BC. So it was long before Josephus. And he's quoting history of what this Babylonian priest had saw in the gardens of Babylon. So we're going to look at a lot of Edenic language that you're going to notice. So I'm going to run through some of these just to show you how God talks constantly all throughout the Old Testament and he never stops, which tells a lot about 
his heart and his reflection and how he sees us. Look at Genesis 1:22. God blesses the sea creatures and the birds he had just created on the fifth day and tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and the seas. Then, after that, he creates man and woman in his own image and blesses them and commands them to what? Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and, you know, unlike the animals, have dominion over all living things. Genesis 8, after the flood, God speaks to Noah as he leaves the ark, telling them to bring out all the living creatures so they can be fruitful and multiply and swarm the earth. A replenishing command after his judgment. Genesis 9, he says it again. He repeats the Edenic command to be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 9, he speaks directly to Noah and his sons again, commanding them to be fruitful and multiply and swarm the earth. Genesis 17, when he blesses Abraham and he says, look, you and I are going to make a covenant. This is what I'm going to do for you. These are my promises. And when all of a sudden God promises that Ishmael will be blessed, made fruitful, and multiplied exceedingly into a great Nation. He uses the same language even for Ishmael, even though Ishmael was not the person he made the covenant with. But when you look, Ishmael was added to the covenant as a beneficiary in the same chapter. Genesis 28. Look at Isaac. He blesses Jacob and prays that God would make him fruitful and multiply him. I wonder where he got this idea from. Genesis 35. God appears to Jacob changes his name to Israel, blesses him, and promises that he will be fruitful and multiply into a nation, an assembly of nations. Jeremiah, now we're at the time where Israel is just basically cheating on God at this point. You know, there are idolatries and idols everywhere. There are Asherah poles, totem poles all throughout the entire area of Jerusalem. It's pretty bad. And Jeremiah is the final prophet. He is the strike number two. After that, there is no more. He's the final guy to stand up and say, Israel, repent, please. If not, God is going to punish us with the current reigning empire. And that was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. A promise of God will regather his scattered flock, bring them back to their folds, and cause them to be fruitful and multiply and increase after the time of judgment, right? The 70 years that they were uh, exiled and finally you know they came back but when God said that they were gonna come back how did he say they were gonna come back what were they gonna do they're gonna be fruitful and multiply it goes to show that whatever Eden was it was more than a physical location it was a plan it was a way of life it was wherever they went that's all another topic or is it? Now, if you look in Isaiah chapter 5, there's this beautiful little analogy or this beautiful parable that God tells through Isaiah. And so the prophet Isaiah, he sings a parable comparing Israel to a vineyard. God planted and cared for Israel, but instead of good fruit, it produced bad fruit. And God warns that he will tear down and destroy the vineyard of Israel for yielding wild grapes. Now, we're going to get into what wild grapes are. This metaphor comes after earlier oracles of judgment against Israel for their sins. So you can see that all this type of fruit reflection is a reflection of their spiritual state. In Ezekiel 19, it continues to go on. Kings are compared to once fruitful vines, but guess what? They're uprooted and lament. Hosea 10. Once again, Israel is depicted as a luxurious vine that yields fruit for himself, indicted or indicted, right, for turning the false gods or relying on military might. Psalm 80, Israel is likened to a vine that God brought out of Egypt and planted, but is now destroyed. And a plea for restoration of that garden, it comes by the Israelites. You look at Jeremiah again. God reminds Israel that he planted them a choice Vine. I want you guys to remember that for later. A choice vine. Why? Because the things that God says, the more you understand like what he really means, it will show you the, the, the reflection of his heart. 
And it speaks a lot about him by the words that God uses to describe people. But they turned against him into a degenerate plant. Ezekiel 15, again, a parable of a wood from a grapevine. Useless. I want you to remember that word, useless, because it's going to be a synonym for another word that starts with a W. And only fit for burning. Again, I want you to remember that too. Fit for burning. He's not the only person that speaks about, you know, burning bad fruit. Jesus does too. A metaphor for Judah and Jerusalem who will face judgment and fire. And of course, John 15, I just got done saying, Jesus describes himself as the true vine. And believers are the branches. And it's a later spiritual application of the vine metaphor. And again, we're going to cover that too. But the reason why I'm showing all this is to show that whatever was going on in God's mind, this is the image that he had when it came to the spiritual state of people. Fruit and the virtues. I want to go ahead and touch just a little bit on the fruit of the spirit. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and touch on it exactly uh, uh, verbatim, but I'm going to gloss over it because we're going to talk about the fruit and the spirit in part two. But there's something that I think the men need to listen up here. A lot of times as a man, when you think about fruit, you know, when we think about fruit, we think about women, right? Let's just be honest. Fruit, it's colorful, it's sweet, like a female. However, when it comes to this word fruit and virtues, it has very much to do with you. If you notice, the word fruit is a Latin word, or actually, I'm sorry, the word virtue is a Latin word for virtus, and it means to be masculine, courageous, full of valor. The reason why I'm associating fruit with virtue is because this is a synonym, or in other words, the, the real core word of what, what fruit is in terms of human beings. So when you talk about fruits, you talk about virtues. Ver is a root word in Latin that means man. Let that sink in. Virtus goes beyond virtue in English. It could be translated better as worth or living up to one's true potential. So whatever virtue was or whatever it is to be virtuous was associated with being whatever a man is supposed to be. So to be a man is to be virtuous. To be a man is to have virtue. Amen. For the Romans, virtus meant living up to societal and personal expectations of behavior. And of course, Aristotle, as he had said in his Nicomachean Ethics, in book 1, chapter 13, he says, quote, For as a fruit of the earth is the end of cultivation, so the fruit of life is the end of living. When they say end, they mean like the goal. Telos, the goal, the end. Fruit and the virtues. Again, Paul, he has a whole cluster of these virtues. He calls them the fruit of the spirit. Their love, joy, patience, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He's not the only one to come up with these cluster of virtues and this whole list of things that men are to live up to and to be. Do you ever notice that you have phrases out there like, I'm a man of my word? Well, you have to be virtuous. You have to stand on some kind of principle. This is why these phrases come about. Plato, he wrote his cardinal virtues, and his was wisdom, temperance, courage, and justice. Aristotle, he wrote his virtues. His was temperance, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, 
proper ambition, truthfulness or sincerity, wittiness, friendliness, and modesty. The Stoic virtues. Yes, even the Stoics have their own. You want to know who the Stoics are? Definitely look them up, but they were around in the New Testament. Paul preached the gospel to them on Mars Hill, the Hill of Philosophy, in Acts 17. Definitely give it a read sometime. There's where justice, temperance, prudence, courage, and detachment, right? I know for, for men, it's very important that they don't allow something to get so attached to them that all of a sudden, it causes them to do things that are not so virtuous in principle, ethics, and order, right? Maybe they might have something that's so attached to them that it causes them, it causes them to go ahead and break away from that type of stoic living. Break away from order. So they practice a sort of detachment. Not that it's entirely wrong, you know, I could definitely understand. But you can see that Paul is within line of a lot of people who end up talking the same way. So the Lord uses Paul to go ahead and get in on these types of principles. And God, through Paul, lays down his own. Good fruits. Now this is a part where I was telling you guys, please keep the key words in mind I was trying to tell you about earlier. Because if we're to go ahead and produce good fruit as men and women, then we know that there are times where God definitely describes individuals, groups of people, or even a whole nation as a type of fruit. Which presupposes that these types of fruit that God is describing has some type of characteristics that they do. And if we see these type of characteristics, well, what do we find? Are we acting like that? Are we behaving like that? Whether for good or for evil? Let me give y'all something to think about. A farmer in this area understands God more than anyone. grapes now grape vines are carefully propagated by taking cuttings from healthy vines to ensure desirable variable characteristics in other words if you get a good cluster of grapes the way that that farmer made some good grapes he took the strongest most fruitful parts of those grapes the ones that produce real big good sweet ones he cut it and from there, he planted that little, little vine. He just kept on doing it over and over. So he always took the best of the best of the best, and he reproduced those. That's what he did. It was more like a choice vine, right? Also, they require well-drained, nutrient-rich soil, as grapes are high in demand as crops. Back then, everyone wanted grapes like water. So whatever grapes were, everyone was looking for. So, if God is in your life the way that he truly should be, don't be surprised if everyone is kind of looking for you. Where all of a sudden you, you become vital to someone. Whether no, Even if you're really, really good on your job, you have now become a choice grape. Everyone's looking for you. You are in high demand. Pruning, it removes up to 90% of the shoots and canes to restrict the growth to the most productive part of the wood. Now, I'm going to break that down later. We're going to talk about pruning later, but I want to go ahead and just kind of, you know, put a little general piece on it just right there. But we're going to come back to that and to show what that process is and why that's so important and what it has to do with us. Now, there's balanced pruning and it maintains yield and vigor over a long term. And that means that grapes develop through three main stages, flowering, fruit set, ripening. Those three stages go over and over and over again. And the ripening process is influenced by temperature, sunlight, and moisture. So it's not just the things that are within the ground. Right, the word and the you know the, the the spiritual things that we do that are within the dirt, and all of a sudden we get all the goodness coming up from within. It also is affected by the the temporal things, right? The things outside of it, 
temperature, sunlight, moisture, its environment also fosters its growth too, right? It has an effect on its growth. So even though it's an inside job with the dirt and it's getting its goodness from there, also the world has an effect on the fruit process, right? This kind of gets into some of Jesus' parables and all that about producing good fruit, but we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. Now, it takes three to five years for new vines to mature before large harvest. But after that, grace can produce for decades if the farmer takes care of those vines properly after each season. Pruning, nutrients, sun exposure, all these factors have to be managed carefully. It's a lot of work, but those who those sweet grapes, oh man, they're so worth it. So you mean to tell me if you take a fresh brand new grapefruit or not or a brand new grape a brand new vine and you work three to five years on it you'll get good stuff for decades apply that to a human being brand new baby the first three to five years you put in that work you do all you can well if you play your cards right you could get something back in terms of your, your good child to rise up to call you blessed for decades We'll go in the right de- direction for decades, right? You set a child in the way he should go, he will never depart from it. So, the little bit of years that you spend working them good grapes, all of a sudden, can last for decades. That goes for the newly saved as well. Olives. Now, this is interesting. Because so far, this is like the only other thing that's closest to a grape. They're almost twins in how they're described. But, you know, there's some slight differences. There's one thing I noticed the difference between grapes and olives. If you're more like an olive, there's one word that describes your life path. Or the quality of it. Time. Time. Olive trees are propagated or cloned by taking cuttings or root sprouts from existing trees, right? You already have to have them there in order to get them. And they need full sunlight and they tolerate rocky, poor nutrient soils but produce the best and rich soils. In other words, this type of thing can go ahead and thrive in some pretty ugly places. It can be a light in dark places. Now, of course, it could be a a beaming light in rich soil. Now, harvest timing depends on desired olive ripeness and oil content. In other words, the better you play your timing with this type of thing, the better you're going to get out of it. The question is, what kind of fruit are you for God? Is your life more that of a characteristic of a grape? of an olive in order to answer that you have to pay attention to your life and God may be trying to tell you something why because he calls Israel and the church all kinds of fruits all the time depending on how they're acting but God did not stop I'm sure he calls you some kind of fruit as well you just have to listen Oils or olives pressed right away make the best freshest olive oil. Once again, timing. You get that thing right away. You press that oil right away. What you you know you don't sit there and wait. Oh God told me to do something. Oh, I'm kind of waiting for it. Uh, you know I'm just uh I'll, I'll, I'll wait a little longer. But, well now all of a sudden what well, it's not going to be as potent. It's not going to be as fresh. Anytime that your parents or your, your loved one or someone, a family member or your friend, you know, they end up making breakfast in the morning. What do they say? Get it while it's hot. You wait, it's going to cool down. The first pressing extracts the finest extra virgin olive oil. The first pressing. Not the third, not the fourth, not... No. You gotta you, you, when, when you do your first pressing, you, you better nail it the first time, cause that's that's the one where you're gonna get your freshest one. Again, timing is everything to an olive. Are children more like olives, where it's real time sensitive, or are adults more like olives when it's time sensitive? 
Olive trees can produce for centuries if properly cared for when mature. Now, why is this important? Because olives produce olive oil. And we all know that oil, especially in the Old Testament, in the ancient Near East, represents the spirit. Remember, if you wanted to be king, you had to be what? Anointed with oil. The Persian kings, they could definitely re um, relate to this. Because again, you wanted some kind of sign that your deity was with you. And we all know the story of David, don't we? Oh, Jesse, give me all your sons. One of them is to be king. Samuel went. He tried to pour the oil on the heads of all his sons. But of course, none of his, the, the, the cup wouldn't run out. The, the cup wouldn't, you know, the, the oil in the cup wouldn't come out. We all know the story. Samuel the prophet said, look, this oil is in my cup, but it's not running over their heads every time I pour it over. You see it. Do you have another son? Well, yeah, I do. Uh, he's, he's, you know, he's uh, tending some sheep. Well, go get him. We all know what happened. He got little David. He took that cup, poured it over his head. The oil, which represented the spirit, covered it. So, olive oil represents the spirit. This thing can go ahead and produce for centuries, right? Almost as if olive oil is eternal. Like our spirit is eternal. Figs. Now, we do know that, by the way, that figs are made and, you know, pretty much like... More like how they look, okay? Uh... <laughs> more how they look we know that figs kind of represent a uh, certain gender more predominantly than any other and of course that's men figs rarely need pruning when mature you don't have to constantly revise and redirect these guys no it's pretty simple like men are very simple you give them an objective you wind them up you set them up and go and that's it so figs rarely need pruning when mature, but shaping young trees helps strong branching, right? Ripe figs are highly perishable and delicate, require rapid consumption or preservation. So they kind of have something similar with, with olive, right? Uh, in other words, get it while it's hot. It can go ahead and be perishable if, if you don't consume it right away. You gotta go ahead and do something with it right away or preserve it right away. With ideal dry conditions, fig trees can bear for over a century. Okay, about a hundred years. They thrive in full sunlight and require well-drained soil. So these figs need the sun right all of you know all God's people <laughs> definitely need God you know you can look at God as a sunlight well-drained soil is also crucial because fig roots are prone to fungal diseases if exposed to excessive moisture in other words these things thrive off of dryness and sunlight right they're not too fond of water no they need the sun they need the sun they don't need to be drowned out by the earthly waters of pleasure or nothing like that these things need the sun to do what they do figs really want the hottest sunniest part of the garden and a light soil mix you probably um, reserve for like cacti and things like that so again it seems that figs were made to 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 need the sun just like men, men were, were made to, to need God. Of course, so, so are women, of course, you know. Um, but it's interesting that, that this relationship with sunlight and heat with, with figs here. Bearing fruit and salvation. Now, one thing I want to talk about when we look at the way we're saved, when we look at the way that we you know our, our walk our whole lives you have to look at it in terms of fruit 
because it presupposes that your salvation is not a status, it's a process. Because that is a way that God, uh, the Father, Jesus, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Apostles, that they all describe our salvation as some kind of process in one way or another. And this is why fruit comes into the fray when it comes to this. So pruning. Let me read this and then I'll explain it to you. Unchecked nutrient flow to stem tips only result in leaves, shoots, growth, but doesn't contribute to develop generative tissues, such as flowers or fruits. Pruning redirects the nutrient life sap, the spirit of the thing, that flows through the entire tree to fruitful branches, enacting the conditions of the fruitful branch for the plant's intended purpose, to continually bear fruit in its seasons. What did I just say? I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you have a tree, then you see a branch. At the end of the branch, there is a tender twig, and at the end of that tender twig, there's a fruit. Inside that tree and that root and that branch and that tender twig is some kind of life force called sap. It goes and permeates throughout the whole tree until certain parts of the tree produce a fruit. So you could pretend that life sap is like the spirit of God that permeates a tree. And as long as the little excuse me, as long as that little twig is connected to the branch, and the branch is connected to the the tree stump and all that, they're gonna go ahead and get what the spirit is giving. And that will result in fruit. Now, there's a little issue. If you don't prune your trees, then that little avenue is still there. Right? The little avenue that once had a, 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 a fruit at the end of it. Well, if all of a sudden now you want new fruit, well, yeah, you may get new fruit, but you might not get, you know, as much new fruit, or it might not be as potent as the last generation. Why? Because that last generation wasn't pruned. And that means all that life sap that's going through the whole tree, it includes that little area that once had a fruit at the end of it. Now that life sap is going to that dead end area. That area already produced fruit. So why is the life sap still going through that little area? That's a waste of sap. That's a waste of spirit energy. That could have went to an area where it had uh, you know, a, a little twig ready to give fruit. So that's why pruning is done by farmers, right? You go ahead and take that part that's already given the fruit, you prune it, you cut that off. You don't want extra sap sitting in an area that's not going to go ahead and produce any fruit. No, it already produced fruit in that avenue. Cut that area off and make sure the highway goes to the areas where it's needed to get the fruit. That's why they prune. That's why they prune. You see that? So believers similarly require pruning, the deliberate and ascetical removal of thoughts, habits, influences that hinder the fruit of holiness, Christ-like virtues and redemptive good works, rather than expending time and energy in areas unaligned with God's will. Pruning facilitates staying centered on that which eternally matters. So every once in a while, our spirits need pruned, right? You know, we produce fruit in, in certain areas, and now, you know, hey, God might switch us up. Okay, well, now we're going to move in a different direction here. You're at a different area of your age in life, and therefore, now you're going to go ahead and produce fruit over here. All right, we're going to prune you. Well, God, I like that area over there. Why is it gone in my life now? I mean, I got this new stuff going on, but what about this over here? Weren't we just, didn't we do good over here? Shouldn't we keep going? Well, God might want to be like, well, that's that's good, but now I'm going to prune that. And now I want you to go ahead and produce some fruit on another area of your branch. We're going to go here at this age in your life or whatever it is. Don't all of a sudden fight God and he's trying to prune you and you just keep moving. <laughs> No, I, uh, uh, that's the devil. <laughs> no, might be God trying to prune you. You know, you did good in that area. All right, let's let's 
go ahead and, and cut that, you know. Oh no, it's gone now. I lost that job or whatever it is. Pruning. All right, now you bearing fruit in a new area. Now you're in a new area in your life. Pruning. Amen. As an agriculture, divine pruning purifies motive and liberates capacity to impart life. This phenomena highlights the continual cooperative work between divine gardener and the human soil of the soul that yield fruit harvest, befitting the labor and love poured out. It is a cooperative effort, right? You have to put yourself forth to be pruned by God, constantly pruned. If there's things that, you know, you have some great, wonderful fruit in your life, all right, well now, okay, we're going to go and prune that. God's going to do a new thing. Now we're going to go over here. You know, he is the one that leads and you follow. So, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Discipline, the long suffering. Now, I decided to highlight some of these on purpose because I want you to catch these as like catch words, catch phrases, associate them with fruit. Listen to how the Hebrews talks about this uh, discipleship and long suffering. For consider the one who endures such hostility by sinners against himself, that you will not grow weary in your souls and give up. You have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood as to struggle against sin. As you have completely forgotten the exhortation which instructs you as sons, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline or give up when you're corrected by him. For the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves and punishes his son, every son, every daughter, every child whom he accepts. Endure it for discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, in which all legitimate sons have become participants, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had our earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Will we not much rather subject ourselves to the fathers of spirits and live? So notice, it's a both and. You subject yourself to your spiritual father, your priest, your pastor one over you and even more you subject yourself to God it's a both and who well they disciplined us for a few days according to what seemed appropriate to them now notice this is authoritative this is the same thing you find in Acts 15 when the Apostles stand up and they say it seems good to me and the Holy Ghost that they should what fill in the blank and it's talking about what the Gentiles should do so notice it was authoritative that's a whole nother topic now oh I'm sorry but he does so for our benefit in order that we may have a share in his holiness and I can understand that because if you discipline somebody enough and they participate with that discipline no matter how painful it will result in all that unholiness leaving them those unholy uh, uh, lifestyles and attitudes you know what I mean uh, and from there they can participate and share in God's holiness now now that they've given up the unholiness now all discipline seems for the moment to be joyful I mean not to be joyful but painful but later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness and of course that's justification so another subject for those who are trained by it so notice this word that we fling around all the time justification that we often use as a status is being used as a process because when we think about fruit, it is a process. And if salvation is being compared to fruit, and we constantly see right here when fruit is talking about justification, righteousness, and things like that, then salvation itself is primarily a process, not just a status. The status is there because of the process. Vines, branches, pruning. We know this one. This is Jesus. We take his word seriously. This is Jesus speaking. I am the vine, 
and my father is a vine dresser. Okay, so he's a farmer. Huh? Okay. Every branch that does not bear fruit in me, once again, that's in Christ. So you already have to be in Christ in order to go ahead and, and, and you know, uh, begin to have an opportunity to bear fruit. And if you're in Christ, that means that you're saved. If you don't bear fruit in me, then he removes it. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it in order that it may bear more fruit. Oh, is this making sense now? You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is not able to bear fruit from itself unless it remains in me, in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him, this one bears much fruit. From apart from me, you are not able to do anything. Makes sense, simple enough. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out as a branch and dries up and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be given to you. Notice that this asking and all this has something to do with your fruit walk in your life. The quality of your salvation has something to do with you asking whatever will be done for you. I mean, I, I would presume that the things you would ask for would be things that would contribute to your fruit that God wants. That's just my thought. I mean, hey, your prayers may be filled with other things. I would think that perhaps this kind of prayers and things might be among them. My father is glorified by this. Oh, really? Huh. That you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Now notice that when it comes to Jesus here, Jesus does not, um, how can I say, Jesus does not separate status from process. He doesn't separate a one moment of your salvation from your life in salvation it's like a marriage everyone looks forward to the marriage day the great the day is over the ceremony is done well guess what now you have to live out that marriage everyone puts the emphasis on the status but not the process process is part of your salvation and it can affect it Salvation is not something that all of a sudden you have as a status and that's it. No, it is a process. It's something that you start and you go through this process of change and growth and fruit throughout your life. And it's a beautiful, adventurous, trying process. And if you don't choose to go ahead and do that with your salvation throughout your walk in your life, then according to Jesus, he you know, you're just cast into the fire. We know what that means. So, being saved is one thing. Bearing fruit in your salvation is another thing. People think, now that I'm saved, okay, I'm good. No, you're not good. Once you're saved, now you have to bear fruit. What is this fruit? Like I said, well, there's two types. I've been focusing on the internal type, right, which would be Galatians. And then, of course, there's the external type, which I always end up linking to Matthew 25. You know, when Jesus talks about Matthew 25, we all know Matthew 25. I was hungry. You gave me something to drink. Or you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me to drink. I was in prison. You visited me. In other words, you do good works. You do good deeds. You do alms giving, you know, which is feeding the poor with, you know, whatever you have. Um, there's all types of things that describe good works in the New Testament. So if you just go to look up good works, there's all kinds of them. And, um, you know, you can go to just do many yourself. But you begin to do these things in Christ, right, as you're saved. 
and it does something to your soul. It does. That's why Paul said what? Our Lord said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So you're blessed when you give and bless somebody else. I wonder how you're blessed. Oh, it has to be internal. Doing things for others, it does put a change to your soul. It molds your character. It does something to your essence. It does something to your soul. It changes you as a person. Good works contribute to the fruit in your salvation. Period. John 15, Jesus is very clear. There's no getting around this. Who in the world would want to go ahead and downplay this process? Who would want to downplay what Jesus is clearly saying here? Bad fruit. I don't think I have to say much about this. Let's see what bad fruit looks like. Wild olives. Yeah, we spoke about olives. But what about wild olives? Well, wild olives, they're a bit of a different kind of character. Wild olive trees proliferated without cultivation in ancient Israel and I'm pretty sure all throughout the world now we know that it takes a farmer the hand of a man to cultivate a plant like olives but oh they don't have anyone working with them they don't have anyone looking after them they don't have anyone they just go to pro proliferate they, they multiply themselves without cultivation Without an apostolic succession, without a, a man or at least somebody, a pastor, someone in your life. No, you, you, you're just out there producing. They produce small, bitter fruits with minimal oil compared to cultivated olives. So, they're just proliferating. They're wild. You could find them anywhere. You're walking around somewhere. And, oh, look, there's in the world of olives going out here. Oh, wow, it's look pretty random. There ain't nothing else out here. How in the world did this thing get out here? The Hebrew terms reference wild olive trees as worthless. Isaiah envisions fruitless efforts to glean from unmanaged wild trees. A symbol of uncontrolled abundance versus orchard cultivation. Uncontrolled abundance. Yes, in other words, there is abundance, but there ain't no one at the helm. There's no one steering this thing in a certain direction to control its abundance of where it's going to be and, and where it's going to go and flow into this area. That's not how Paul and Barnabas did in Acts 11. Why don't you read Acts 11? Just read it for yourself. See if you don't find a scene in there where Paul and Barnabas are before the priests, um, you know, the Christian priests there. And they are praying and fasting and worshiping before the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and speaks to them and says, Send Barnabas and Paul uh, to this area where I will show them to go and tell them to go here. And then they're going to go there and do this. You don't have that with uncontrolled abundance. Ain't no one telling you where, leading you where to go. You got abundance, though. So far, the abundance is small, bitter fruits with minimal oil. But, hey, there's a lot of it, right? I mean, what is it? Is it worthless, though? These are things you have to think about. Wild olive shoots hindered field crops as weeds seeking sunlight. Mmm, man. Farmers prune back branches encroaching on fields. Man, now all of a sudden, these same kind of 
uh, wild olives are, I guess, getting into the fields of farmers who have this set up little farm area, like churches and stuff. They're coming on in, but I guess they're not, you know, growing in the way that everyone else is growing. I don't want to grow that way. But I do want to go ahead and be around here, though. Hmm. Think about it. Grafting and pruning needed for fruitful domesticated trees. Now notice that these are fruitful domesticated trees that needed are needed for grafting and pruning. Well, if you're not domesticated and you're wild, then there's no way you can experience this kind of process. A metaphor for spiritual defects requiring diligent correction. I know that's right. Wild olive groves represented lack of care versus orderly orchards. Yeah, if there's no one over you, you know. You know, the person that's looking around who wrote the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, it just got done saying, you know, if a father doesn't discipline his child, then he's not his child. He's an illegitimate. He doesn't partake in his holiness. He doesn't care about it. You see how this is all flowing together? wild grapes now we just got done talking about regular grapes well what about wild grapes what's their story well again it seems to be a twin of the olive I keep on noticing that the olives and the grapes are kind of similar here all the time no matter what whether it's a good process or a bad process wild grapes grew abundantly without cultivation in ancient Levant right and uh, it also says that they were smaller and more bitter than cultivated grapes. And yes, again, the Hebrew term was worthless. You see a pattern here? Jeremiah contrasts wild grapes and cultivated vines as a metaphor for spiritual waywardness. Yes, you are going away from the one who was cultivating you the whole time. You know, you're just kind of wayward, doing your own thing. Cultivated grapes required extensive labor, pruning, fertilizing, irrigation. In other words, when there was a farmer there, he worked on you. All right. You ended up going to church. You heard the, the word of the pastor that the Lord was giving him the word. You go on ahead and you would go ahead and, and have someone you would be accountable to. You would go up and receive prayer to say, God, forgive me. The pastor would pray for you. He probably pull you aside. The Holy Spirit would speak to the pastor and say, hey, you got to go to get this right in your life. When you leave this congregation today for these seven days until I see you next Sunday, make sure you go in this direction. Direction, all right and also for those who are Orthodox like myself you know uh, you go to a priest you know and from there you do confession you speak about your spiritual defects and from there the Spirit of God moves on that priest and he speaks to that priest and says oh, you know what I was listening to your pitfalls and the stuff that caused you to sin so you know what I'm, I'm gonna prescribe to you like a good spiritual doctor you know I'm gonna prescribe to you that you do this I just got done reading this by the church father and I want you to read this little chapter right here. I believe this will bless you, give you some direction. And also, when you pray, um, I'm going to prescribe these types of prayers here. I want you to pray these specific prayers here. And um, from there, I also want you to fast. This is a certain day I want you to fast. I know that perhaps you're not that good at it right now, but I want you to fast on this day. And I'll be fasting with you as your priest. You know. And uh, when we meet together again, I want you to tell me how you're doing. Pruning, fertilizing, irrigation. You have to have someone over you to work on you. Wild grapes grew uncontrolled, hindering agriculture. Now, wait just a second. Now these wild grapes are growing uncontrolled, but it seems here that they're growing uncontrolled in very uh, controlled or cultivated places like churches. It says that they hinder agriculture. So that means if you got a nice little, you know, cultivated grapes doing your thing, 
And all of a sudden you have wild grapes starting to grow into your little farm area. Well, you got to do something with that. Because it'll hinder the agriculture of what the spirit is doing in the church right here. So when you have wild grapes coming into the church, growing into the church, this is why they are to go ahead and be cultivated. They are to go ahead and change. Right? They're not to remain a wild grape. No. If they come into this area, they change and grow for the better just like everybody else. Or they go ahead and change and hinder the growth of the church that, that God put you under. Or God put, put under you. And of course, uh, as a pastor, you would have a lot of explaining to do. You know? They symbolize unchecked abundance versus diligent cultivation. Again, they can be very abundant, but according to earlier stuff, abundant in what? Small, bitter grapes. Who's going to want to eat those? They're deemed, from the Hebrew terms, as worthless. No one really wants them. So, it's abundant. But abundant what? A metaphor critiques Israel turning from righteousness to spiritual wildness. Archaeological evidence shows techniques used to improve cultivated grapes. So, there are certain things that farmers do little techniques and stuff that I'm sure that they passed on to improve cultivated grapes you know it's a process that seems like the wild grapes don't really get a share in because it requires a person other than you to do that process upon yourself not for you to do it on yourself for someone else to So, definitely get Life in Biblical Israel. This is a wonderful book. This is where most of this information is even coming from anyway. If I were you, I would take a little 20, 25 bucks and boom, buy the book. And it's, it's yours for life. You could, you know, dive in and get tons more of what I've done here. Tons. Now, bearing fruit and salvation. If you look at Matthew 12... Once again, we find another little key word I highlighted for you. Jesus says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Offspring of vipers. Of course, he's talking to the Pharisees at this moment. In this scene. How are you able to say good things when you are evil? For from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Ah, so the heart is the root. The mouth is where the fruit comes out of. Hmm. The heart. Like the soil of the heart. Where words are planted. The good person from his good treasury brings out good things. And the evil person from his evil treasury brings out evil things. But I tell you that every worthless word that they speak. Worthless. People will be given an account of it for a day of judgment. Now remember, this worthless is once again tied to a type of quality of fruit. Hmm. For by your words you'll be vindicated, and by your words you'll be condemned. Matthew 12. So, before you are to bear fruit, you have to be that fruit. This is a process. This is not a status right you have to cultivate yourself before you bear you have to become thistles and thorns now we're no longer in the types of fruits anymore now we're just into all kind of stuff that just gets in the way of bearing fruit okay we're not even talking about types of fruits anymore now we're just talking about other crazy stuff we're in wild land now Thistles and thorns. Thistles were invasive weeds, hindering ancient farming. Species like scotch thistle and puncture vine infested fields. These guys aren't bringing anything to the table. These are the wolves among sheep. These are the, the, 
the individuals who are coming in and they are not even fruits. No. These individuals need a complete transformation of heart, a complete con conversion, a complete deliverance. This will spread extensive roots, reproduced rapidly. That's why I'm really not fond of things that kind of grow very fast. Man, our ministry started out, and within three weeks, we had 9,000 people in our church. Really? Yeah, last time I checked, I don't remember nature ever producing that fast. Usually around here, things take time here on Earth. Hmm. Watch it. Depleted soil nutrients reduce crop fertility. So, they deplete soil nutrients. Thorns hindered plowing. They hindered planting. They hindered harvesting activities. I can imagine that. Imagine seeing them things in your backyard. You couldn't do anything. You first had to gut out your whole uh, soil before you plant a seed. Farmers removed thistles through tillage, hoeing, and herbicides. Metaphor for hardship imposed by uncontrolled weed growth. Thistles and thorns. Wherever you go, do you leave anything behind good or leave anything behind bad? Is it worse when you leave or is it better when you leave? thistles, fruitless trees. But these persons blaspheme all they do not understand. Wow. Anything they don't understand, they ridicule. That's interesting. And all that they understand by instinct, like the irrational animals, by these things they are being destroyed. Woe to them. For they have traveled in the way of Cain, and they have given themselves up to the error of Balaam for gain, and they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the ones feasting together without reverence. Now, let me pause right here. I have to say this. Feasting together. You talk about love feasts, certain feasts, right? It was tied to the Eucharist. The eating of the body and blood. You did it with reverence. Afterwards, there was a small meal done for the early Christians. That's the way they did it. To the Eucharist, and then from there, there's a small little gathering meal. All of that was done with reverence. These are the ones feasting together without reverence hidden reefs at your love feasts, caring for themselves, waterless clouds carried away by winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, uprooted. Jude chapter 1 verses 10 through 12. This is a book that's before the book of Revelation. We're coming at nearly the end of the Bible and people are still talking like this. I hope that when you begin to think about every type of fruit that we have gone through, that when you check your own conscience, that your conscience does not talk about you like this. You want to be spoken of as a good fruit. Everything said in this scripture, but the opposite. Amen. Hemlock. Hemlock was a toxic weed in ancient Israel. Now it's getting even worse. Now we're bringing chemicals into the fray. Poisonous to humans and livestock if consumed. I don't know who would be foolish enough to consume that stuff. So now all of a sudden, it's the exact opposite. Now, you got things that are packing things that could be consumed, but guess what? It does the opposite. It does not give nutrition. It, it destroys you. Now they're carrying death. Now it's getting worse. I feel like I'm part of an iceberg that I'm doing. Remember the icebergs? If you, if you YouTube an iceberg, you know, 
in the surface above the water, yeah, you may find some regular stuff. Then you go under the water, then you start finding some issues. Then you go lower underneath the water even more. Then you find more issues. Then you go even more lower. And then you find more issues. Okay, so this is the way that it seemed that these plants are going. How much lower can it get? This is bad. Spread rapidly as invasive plant, difficult to control. Again, why is it that all the bad stuff has this ability to spread so fast? But the good stuff? No, that takes time. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Hosea compares unchecked wickedness to hemlock growth. Metaphor for how sin can corrupt society when left unrestrained. Right? Sin is like a poison. Right? Once it runs through stuff, all of a sudden things start being corrupt and start to die. Especially if it's left unconstrained and no one does anything about it. Archaeological evidence shows hemlock was a common weed pest. Jeez. Represented the potential for evil to poison righteousness. This is the arc enemy of righteousness. If righteousness is a make you better, hemlock makes you worse. It's not thistles and thorns where it just kind of hinders your growth a little bit. No, it's there to end it. A carob tree. Carob trees grew widely without cultivation in ancient Israel. Again, now you have a whole tree that's growing wildly and no one's cultivating it. No one planted that seed in a specific area for this area. No, it was cast and tossed to and fro by the wind and wherever that seed landed, that's where it went. And that's it. Oh, look at this. Look at this church. Look at this place here. Look at that place there. Look at this uh, group over here. Look at this people over here. Oh, that's... Uh, I don't know what it came from, but, you know, it seems to be a tree. Let's go there. Hmm. Long seed pods provided low-quality animal fodder during famine. Not a desirable human food compared to grains, olives, or grapes. They're mentioned in a parable of the prodigal son symbolizing desperation. We all remember the parable of the prodigal son. He spent all his money foolishly, right? That he got from his father's inheritance, which he was supposed to receive after he died. But he wanted his inheritance more than he wanted his relationship with his father. So he gave him all his money. He spent it foolishly and a famine hit the land. And it says that this tree is mentioned during the famine. I put a little pig there because, of course, we know that uh, he ate out of a pig trough. It wasn't a desirable food either. Associated culturally with livestock feed and poverty. Invaded terraces, rocky soils, field margins, unsuitable for crops. So, if you see this specific tree here, a carob tree, then it means that before you even get to that area, if you see a carob tree from afar off, you already know that that area, that land, wherever it is, there ain't no green grass, no. In other words, the carob tree is a sign that, hey, nothing's living here. That's what the sign of a carob tree is. So if you're walking and you see a carob tree from a mile away, you should know, up, oh, don't, e don't even go through there looking for goodness or looking for goods. Nope, don't even go. Unless, of course, you're sent by God to go ahead and make the place green again. But yeah, people look from afar off and be like, oh, nope, making a left, ain't going there. Well, why are we going there? You see that carob tree? Okay, there's your sign. Ain't nothing there, Jack. Might as well be a stop sign, or, or a detour, whatever. 
Present signified land unsuited for productive agriculture. I just got done saying that. Symbol of low status and lack requiring spiritual cultivation. I bet. Sower. Seed. Grounds. This is uh, something interesting here. I believe Jesus was talking. He said, uh, and while a large crowd was gathering, and they were going to him uh, from town to town, he spoke by means of a parable. The sower went out to his seed to sow his seed, and while he was growing, and while he was sowing, some seed fell on the side of the path and was trampled by underfoot, and the birds of the sky came and devoured that seed. So I guess they ate seed, bird seed. Hmm. Others fell on the rock, and when it came up, it withered because it did not have moisture. I guess this fruit needed moisture. Probably did better if it was a fig. And other seed fell in the midst of the thorn plants, thorns and thistles, and the thorn plants grew up with it and choked it. Wow, it grew up with it and choked it. It grew up with it and choked it. The process that was supposed to go ahead and, you know, give you some fruit. Oh no, you had some hindrance along the way. Choked it. That's why it's so important that, um, <clears throat> you know, you really do uh, stay with someone who could come and prune that out. But, if you're out there and you're just an uncultivated wild olive, and you just happen to be around some thistles, well guess what that thistle is going to do to you, wild olive, wild grape? The little bit of life that you have, oh, it's going to choke you out. Why? Because you're not under a cultivator. You're not under a farmer. You're not under a pastor. You're not under a priest. You're not under a bishop. You're not under an ecumenical patriarch. You're not under anybody to come on in and deal with that stuff. And other seed fell on good soil, and when it came up, it produced a hundred times as much grain. And he said these things, he called out, The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, What is this parable meant? And he said, To you, it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but the rest, they're in parables. So that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable means this. The seed is the word of God. And those beside the path are the ones who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. Hmm. Heart. Didn't we get done saying that, you know, out of your mouth, out of your heart come the mouth of the words and all that stuff? Heart. Mouth. Word. Here it is again, another way. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so that they may not believe and be saved. And those on the rocks are those who receive the word with joy when they hear it, and these do not have enough roots. In other words, they really don't know why they believe what they believe. They're not going to go ahead and be rooted deep in what they believe. No, I'm just going to believe what I believe and that's it. I don't think that I have to have all this kind of theology and deep-rooted stuff. No, I'm just going to believe the word and that's it. But do you know the word? To know the word is to be rooted in the word. Rooted in understanding. No, I got the word. So I'm just going to preach it and believe it. But do you know it? Because when stuff starts getting tough, it starts getting funny. And now you don't know what to do. Well, it says here, they don't have enough root. Who believe for a time, and in a time of testing, they fall away. And the seed that fell onto the thorn plants, mm, these are the ones who hear, and as they go along, are choked by worries and riches and the pleasures of life, and they do not bear fruit to maturity. Hmm. So these thistles and things that you know, they're constantly tied up in. But once again, on the farmer's side, if they had a farmer there, well, maybe they could, you know, get that stuff out of their life. 
But you gotta be a part of a farmer's vineyard first. Can't be out there wild and on your own. So, they all do this fighting by themselves and, and all of a sudden the stuff they produce, uh, it's produced stuff, but it's not to maturity. It's grapes, but they're small. It's grapes, but they're bitter. Amen. But a seed on the good soil, these are the ones who, after hearing the word, hold fast to it with a noble and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. Hmm, patience. That kind of presupposes that stuff don't happen overnight. Huh. Repentance and sanctification. But when you were slaves of sin, you were free with respect to righteousness. Therefore, what sort of fruit did you have then, about which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, and having been enslaved to God, you have your fruit leading to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. Sanctification. That's a process. Eternal life. That's the goal. According to Paul, you need fruit to get there. The word free here means separated or disconnected. As slaves of sin, they had no connection to righteousness. Alright? So that's the way that word free is being used there. Right? You're either free from sin, or you're either, you know, uh, uh, free or away from righteousness. Therefore, produce fruit worthy of repentance. Well, if you're someone that's choked out by thistles and things like that and you produce fruit but it's not mature, is it worthy of repentance? Or is it worthless? Remember the key word? See how it's all coming together? And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And this, now he's, you know, he's basically talking to the Pharisees, right? For I say to you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Already now the axe is positioned at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree not producing good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And of course, at this time, he's talking about Israel. Israel, the olive tree. The axe of judgment was laid at the root of the tree, transitioning from the Old to the New Testament. They had one last time to get their act together. And they could have got it together by entering the New Covenant. But some didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's why the axe was laid to the tree for them. All right. The church and its fruit. Now when a master of the vineyard arrives, what will he say to the tenants and farmers? They said to him, he will destroy those evil men who completely and uh, uh, and lease the vineyard. Yeah, he will destroy those men completely and lease the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give them the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. And it is marvelous, Mar it, it, it isn't it marvelous in his eyes, in our eyes? For this reason I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and it will be given to a people who produce its fruits. I encourage you, read this entire parable. It's really about Jesus being given from the Father to Israel, and they rejected him. And so because of that, the kingdom was taken from them and it was given to a people to bear their fruit, to bear its fruits. So whatever the kingdom of God is, it's supposed to bear fruit and it's given to a people. Who are those people? Those people are believers. That is the people. So. My final thoughts, if I could sum this up, I could definitely say, 
when God speaks to people, when he looks at people, you have to look at it through God's eyes. What do we look like as a field to God? Do we look like a field, a group, a whole nations of people, black, white, whatever, producing fruit? Or do we look like a whole group of people that are full of things that are fruitless, like thorns? Or thistles. This is what we have to think about. So that's the first thing. What do we look like in the eyes of God? Do we look plentiful? Does our spirit really reflect the fruits of the spirit? Or do they pretty much kind of reflect thorns, thistles, cacti? Hemlock, carob trees. What do we look like before God? What do our lives look like? The fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be these virtues that you cultivate when the Spirit of God continues to permeate through your life. This is what we're supposed to be. Now, I know what you guys are all kind of wondering. Well, Matt, you showed us what God wants. So, how do we do it? How do we get there? What are the things that we do? I'm glad you guys asked that question. We're going to go ahead and talk about that next time in part two and beyond. When we speak about the fruits of the spirit explained this is so real from the father's well I pray that this message was very sobering to you and it was a real venture and also pray that you never look at your salvation and your soul and the quality of your soul ever the same again What will you look like? What will your soul look like at the end of your life? Will those eight or nine virtues hang on your soul as fruit? Will God be able to look at your life and truly see Matthew 25 or anything similar in it? Internal fruit, external fruit. This is all, and I pray that it's been a blessing. Peace and blessings, guys.